Right, welcome everyone to Free Back with a Vengeance. So as Aaron said, my name is Regis. I'm a software developer at Purim and I like Scala. Um, but enough about myself. This is all about you and what you can get out of this talk. So let's get started. I want to start off with uh, some background. Uh, we have some tasks that, you know, take a long time to run. And when I say long, I mean, it can take minutes, hours or days, it really depends. And I'm sure you can picture um, in your, at your own company, a set of tasks that has the same kind of uh, properties. And these tasks are like atomic kind of things. They are made of a, a discrete set, uh, discrete steps. Um, these steps feed data into each other. And so what we're thinking, of, uh, what, what I'm thinking about is, uh, pretty much like a workflow, you can picture a workflow diagram where data comes from one system, feeds into another system and so on and so forth. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna use a straw man example for the rest of this talk, uh, which can be described as a very simple build, build pipeline for your program. This will be the foundation for the examples. And I'm hoping that with that, you can imagine how this could apply to perhaps an example that is closer to you, to you. So let's get started. Um, this build pipeline uh, could be described in a very simple program. In fact, it just is like a couple of lines here. And um, so yeah, my talk is, is over, right? <laughs> uh, not quite right. Um, there's a few properties that I'm thinking about when I think about these uh, systems that you know uh, expose long running tasks. Uh, the first one is that I want to be able to um, allocate the work to a cluster of, of slaves. And the reason for that, it should be obvious. If you have something that takes a long time, uh, there is a, an incentive to try to maximize or to minimize the, the time it takes overall by doing tasks in parallel. And that means uh, by running you know, multiple uh, tasks at the same time. Also, um, because of these tasks, because of this property of uh, you know, taking such a long amount of time, the cost of a failure is um, much more dramatic than in a usual program where you have a simple request response round trip. Uh, so what we want to do is have the property of being able to uh, resume a failed job exactly where it, it failed before. So not losing all the, the amount of work that was uh, previously computed. Um, furthermore, um, these workflows usually picture business, business, uh, business logic, like business diagrams. Uh, and in these business diagrams, we do, not, we do not really pay attention to the actual set of computations that are necessary. Uh, but when you analyze these, uh, these diagrams, there is a lot of redundancy and uh, there is opportunity for massively optimizing you know, the actual execution plan. So we want to be able to do that. Uh, well, yeah, that's kind of a, a repetition of the previous point. So when you think about all these properties, uh, the, the piece of code that I showed earlier suddenly becomes uh, much more complicated. Um, if you don't pay attention, your business logic is drowned into you know, accidental complexity and your software suddenly becomes a nightmare to maintain. So we were faced with a similar problem recently. And I was thinking about how we could solve all of these problems at once. And I found out, I won't be able to show you everything, but I found out a uh, um, uh, way of expressing these problems in a fashion that I find quite elegant and that allow me to then reach out each of these system qualities that I, that I, that I so much need. Uh, so what I'm going to show you may sound very academic, but uh, I have tried to apply you know, the set of principles that I learned uh, while studying the Zio library. And um, uh, in particular, there's a, like four things that uh, I find make Zio extremely, extremely successful. The first is that there is no type classes in, in Zio. Um, type classes in Scala are still second class citizens. Uh, they are above a certain level of complexity, very hard to use and not very geometric in Scala. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done to reach you know, a level that 
I find acceptable. The second point is variance. Uh, Scala is a, an object-oriented language. Uh, furthermore, it has you know, uh, parametricity, which means that variance plays uh, an important role in um, making sure that your programs have a nice type inference. Third, I want to avoid academic jargon. And in fact, in the rest of this talk, I'm not going to talk about uh, the mathematical properties or whatever um, that are behind the code. I'm merely going to think from uh, you know, first principles how we can develop these properties naturally. And uh, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek tongue -in joke about Zio, but the more type parameters, the better, uh, because type parameters essentially abstract away a notion that you don't need to represent in your programs. OK, so let's start with part one, which I call functions are not enough. Well, you already know that functions are not enough. Um, they are not enough because uh, we do have to add a structure around the types that we either take as an input or produce as an output. You, you, I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, applicative functors, uh, monads, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but these constructs have limitations. Um, if I take monads as an example, they can model you know, dynamic program trees, but they cannot do any sort of static analysis. Uh, that is a bummer because, as I said, I want to be able to optimize my computation graph. And monads will not be, uh, allow me to do that. Applicative functors, uh, same thing. They are great at static analysis, but they cannot do any kind of dynamic uh, computation. And again, this is a property that is extremely useful for uh, the kind of problem that I, am, uh, that I want to solve. So let's see how we can think about solving these problems uh, from a new perspective. Uh, so this is going to be our starting point here. And let's just look at the type of that function. Again, I'm, I'm going to use the, uh, the actual Scala trait that is used to define functions here. So um, let me give you like the, um, the, the punchline of my talk, which is pretty much how each purely functional design ends up looking. Um, you start from <coughs> something that does not satisfy, satisfy your needs. Then you create a new data type that sort of mimics uh, your starting point, exposes the set of properties that you like from where you start from but does not have the, the properties that you don't want to have. When you have that data type, then you can do it, do, do anything you want with it. Uh, you can transform it. You can, uh, you know, a uh, whole, lo whole lot of things. Uh, you can play with it uh, just because it has the properties that you want to keep. And then finally, at the final step, then you can compile your data type back into a function uh, because Scala is a, <laughs> is still a language that only accepts function as the unit of execution. Uh, at some point, your data type, in order to do something interesting, it has to be converted back, back into a function. All right, so this is going to be our starting point. Um, let's look at the things we like about functions. <clears throat> well, the first point is that we do like uh, the types. Uh, we know that the function takes an input and returns an output. So this is probably something that we are going to, to keep. Uh, so let's do that. I'm going to create a, a new data type uh, that has the same shape as, as a function, but it's not going to be a function. It merely is going to uh, mimic a, a function, so to speak. <clears throat> um, so if I want to be able to mimic a function, I want to be able to represent what um, my function is doing. If we look at the, if we think about the example that I shown, there's uh, like a few specific functions that I had defined, like compilation, running tests, generating documentation, and so on and so forth. So one way to represent these things without without actually writing the function is just to define a token that. Um, is essentially an identifier for, for that function. So, so here, as you can see, I, I define a set of tokens that each represent one specific function. And how does it do it? Well, it, just by merely fixing the type uh, of the input and the output to match the type uh, of the input and the output of um, the corresponding function. OK, so, so that is just 
uh, a token in memory, nothing, nothing special about it. It's just data, it doesn't do anything. But when I see it, I know what it represents. And furthermore, I can take it and uh, convert it back into a function. So here is my compiler. It takes as an input um, a value of my pipeline data type. And as you can see, the result of my function is going to be a function that takes as an input the same input as my pipeline and is going to yield a value that is the same as the output of my pipeline. And if we look at each, uh, if we look at our task, there's only a few uh, discrete values that it can ever take. And whenever we are in each of these branch, uh, suddenly the type in and out take on a, 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 a fixed value. So in the case of compile, in um, is a list of path and out is um, a binary. I'm not going to show the, the implementation of these functions because it doesn't really matter. What matters is that I have a data type and that data type I can, for example, send it over the network. Um, and on the, other, on the other side of that network, I, I can have a, a slave, for example, receiving that data and interpreting it into uh, a function that will then receive my input and, and perform the job as, as appropriate. Send back the response to some kind of master um, master node that is listening for, for data back. So good. Uh, now I sort of have already the, like the full round trip that I, that I depicted a few slides ago. However, as a data type, it's quite disappointing. It doesn't do much. Um, and in particular, it's not able to express a full pipeline. So let's try to think about how we can achieve that by uh, just by looking at the properties of functions that we like to keep. And the first one is obviously function composition. Uh, we are using a functional language. And um, uh, so if we look at you know, functional composition, the uh, obvious way of doing it in Scala is either using the composer or and then combinators on functions. And uh, what I want you to look at is at the result type of the function H, um, which is made of F and G. As you can see, the type B has kind of disappeared. It's, it's sort of become an implementation detail. Um, so if I wanted to represent the same thing with my pipeline, I could, I could just do that by creating a new uh, term of my pipeline language that I call and then. And that term is made of two pipeline itself. And the, 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 the detail that is important here is that of these two pipelines, the only thing they have in common is that type X, uh, that is the output of the first pipeline and the input of uh, the second pipeline. And as you can see, the result type, uh, there is no mention of X anywhere. It's sort of become a, an implementation detail. I also need an identity sort of token because um, identity sort of works as a, as a sort of zero uh, in functional composition. And it's uh, an important uh, um, an important component that we absolutely want to keep. So now that I have that, I need to convert it into, to, to be able to compile it into a program. Uh, well, again, I can update my evaluator. And, and from now on, by the way, I'm going to take some artistic license and, and just strip out all the stuff that I already wrote previously. So here I have two terms that I need to be able to evaluate into a program. Uh, the first one, and then as you can see, uh, as it is made of two terms itself, uh, two terms that need to be evaluated each into a function, I need to do that first in order to get the function that goes from, from in to X and then the other function from X to out. And finally, I can produce a new function that takes my input, will run F, and whenever F terminates, uh, I can you know, flat map uh, and, and execute G to get the out of it out of it. Finally, for my identity pipeline, there's not, not much to do. I just take the input and return it directly. So that's good. With that, I can already start to uh, express uh, composition of pipelines, um, which helps us move forward. But again, it's very limited. Um, you know, functional composition only goes so far. It's kind of an academic exercise to write programs as 
pure composition of functions, but in in the reality of business, uh, it never works like that. Uh, so we have to have some more tools to it. One that is go going to feel like a, a step back, but is, uh, is going to be extremely helpful is that we wanna be able to uh, just transform the data at the edges of our pipeline. And by transforming, I mean, sometimes one task of our pipeline and another task, even if they have, they are supposed to, uh, you know, to follow each other, they do not necessarily match perfectly when, when it comes to uh, the output of one and the input of another. So it's always good to have these uh, functions that we can insert into the middle that can you know, fix that problem for us. So here I'm talking about mapping and contra mapping. Um, so if you think about mapping and contra mapping for functions, it's very much like function composition. In fact, it is function composition. Uh, mapping is pretty much taking the output of a function and transforming, transforming it into something else. Whereas contra mapping is, um, is pre-processing the input of a function and, and turning it into uh, the input that the function actually expects. Now I can do the same for my pipeline. I'm adding a new term called mapping. And this one has three members. The first is going to be the thing that will sort of pre-process my, my pipeline. It takes an input and it produces another input that is the input of my pipeline. That's the second term. That pipeline produces a value of type out zero, which is then going to be transformed by my uh, third term, which is a function that takes the out zero into, uh, into a value of type out. And as you can see, the type of my pipeline is just into out. All these are implementation details. Um, I'm adding a few combinators to make this a bit more idiomatic. Uh, but the real question is, can I uh, evaluate that into a real program? And obviously I can. Again, I'm gonna pattern match on that term. I can extract the inner pipeline, transform it into a function from in zero to out zero, and give back a function that takes the in. The in will be uh, pre-processed by the LMAP function, the first term the output of which will be fed into my, my pipeline. And then when my, when my pipeline is, uh, yields a, a value of type out zero, I'm going to apply the RMAP function, which is the third term that transforms the output. And boom, I'm done. Suddenly I can start transforming um, data in my pipeline. And not only that, but I get also for free the ability to lift existing functions, like simple functions into pipelines. As you can see here with the apply method, uh, the apply method is just taking the identity pipeline, which is going to take my in and just you know return it directly, and I can map over the output of uh, the identity in order to transform that uh, into a value of type out. Another one that is going to be quite useful is um, tupling, where I take my input and I just duplicate it. Um, this is going to be extremely useful for parallel computations. And, 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 and at the same time, I'm also adding a, a com combinator that will uh, run a pipeline, but also produce the input of the pipeline um, as well as the output of the pipeline. OK, nice. But again, not enough. I need more properties. <laughs> And the next one is the ability to run parallel parallel function. So uh, in, in, again, if we look at, uh, at a simple example, uh, when we have two functions that we want to run in parallel, we can do that by generating a third function that takes uh, two arguments as an input. And each argument is, uh, uh, is applied to, uh, to, to, to each function uh, separately. Uh, notice that in, in Lambda calculus, there is no there is no specific specification of uh, how terms should be evaluated, the evaluation order. This is all down to the compiler, essentially. So here, uh, you, can think, you can think of it as a way to make parallel computations. Uh, and this is a property that we like, and this is a property that we want in our pipelines. So again, I'm going to add a new term uh, made of two pipelines, each one having its own input and output. And this will allow me to express a pipeline that takes two inputs 
and produces two outputs, two independent inputs and outputs. Can I evaluate it into a function? Yeah, I can. Obviously, I need to evaluate each members of my zip uh, uh, term and finally produce a function that takes two inputs and I can uh, feed both inputs to uh, each of those functions, which will run in parallel and produce an output um, that is made of uh, the, the two outputs of my, uh, of my branches. Excellent. Now I can start uh, doing a bit more with my pipeline. For example, here I have uh, two tasks. One is packaging, which is going to take the result of my compilation and produce a, an artifact out of it. And uh, my deploy task here takes two things, uh, the artifact itself, as well as the destination repository where uh, the jar has to be uploaded or, or whatever. How do, I, how do I do that? How do I express that as a pipeline? So um, I, I inline the types here so that you can see. I have my packaging tasks, which is going to take as an input um, two things. On the left-hand side, you'll have the inputs for the package task. On the right-hand side, you have the repository itself. Now the repository, where do I get it from? We don't know. Um, that's where the identity combinator comes from. So my package task is made of two tasks. One is the package task itself, and the other is the identity task, which is just going to take the repository and, and send it over unchanged. The result of that pipeline is a, a combination of the jar and the repository, which is exactly the inputs that my deploy, deploy pipeline expects. So I can feed that directly into the deploy pipeline. Nice. Uh, but again, there is a fundamental limitation to that. There is no ability to um, decide whatever we want or uh, if we want to exploit uh, or to execute a pipeline or not. So the ability to branch uh, does not exist yet into our language. And again, this is a property of functions that we absolutely want. Um, so how can we express that using functions? Again, uh, I'm sure um, this will not come as a surprise, whereas we were using, uh, you know, um, tuples for expressing parallel computations. When we want to add branching into a language, we move back to a uh, some type. So here we are going to use the either data type. And depending on whether my input is going to be a left or a right, I can then execute either my f function that is going to be producing a value of type b lifted into my either as a left. Or vice versa, if I get a C, I can produce a value of type D executing G on it and lifting it into either as a right component. Same thing, I can add this to my pipeline data type. I can add a new term that is made of two pipelines and the type of that pipeline is just like the function takes either an in, an in zero or an in one and it produces um, an out zero or an out one. Can I compile that into a function? Obviously, I can. Again, I'm just going to evaluate each term of my uh, of my choice combinator of my choice term, and I get back a function that takes a, an either as an input, and depending on what va what value specifically I, I receive, I can then execute each of those pipeline, uh, the specific pipeline and lift the result into left or right, depending. Okay, um, excellent. Now I can start doing things a bit that are a bit more interesting, a bit more involved. Here, for example, is a pipeline that expresses a simple if then else sort of statement. Uh, so we're starting to, to be able to express programs that are uh, a bit more complex than just passing data around. So if you look at uh, how this is laid out, we have uh, a combinator made of three pipelines. The first is going to be our predicate. So it takes the input and yields a Boolean. Now, depending on the value of the Boolean, we are going to either feed the data into uh, the second uh, parameter or the third pipeline. 
how do we do that? Well, the first thing is uh, not only will we need the outcome of the predicates, but we will also need the, the input uh, that is fed to the predicate uh, so, so that we can then feed that input back into either cons or alt in this case. So I'm going to use the transfer combinator that I defined earlier. Next, um, if we want to uh, feed that into either the cons or the alt um, pipelines, we have to match the types uh, of our recently introduced choice, choice combinator, which means that instead of a tuple made of a, my input and a Boolean, I, I need to transform that into a value of type either. As it turns out, uh, in Boolean uh, is, is isomorphic to either uh, in or in. Uh, they are exactly the same types. So I can, I can simply transform my, the input of my uh, <coughs> predicate by mapping the output. And depending on whether the, predicate, the, the result of uh, execute, execute, executing it is true or false, I can lift my input on the left in order to feed it to my uh, cons pipeline, or I can lift it uh, to the right and feed it to my alt pipeline. Finally, my if then else pipeline takes the input, so the uh, transform finally into an either of in, and then fed into the cons or the alt pipelines using the choose combinator that I just defined. Now the output of that will be uh, an either itself, and we need to merge it back into a single value of type out, and because the two the two members of the, the either I, are exactly the same. We can just map the output of that pipeline and use the merge function on either. And this is all uh, working as expected. Nice. Uh, so uh, with that set of functionalities, I'm actually already able to uh, write full programs. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot more combinators and a lot more properties that, you know, that we wish to exploit from functions. However, during this talk, I, I won't be able to cover all of them. Uh, I'm hoping that during the discussion, uh, I, can, I can perhaps give a bit of an introduction. But let's try to see how we can express our full pipeline using that language that we just defined. So just as a reminder, here is our starting point. <clears throat> so the first thing is we're going to build the pipelines that are necessary to, um, to create the binaries for our programs. So we have the binary for the main sources, binary for the test sources, and um, both of which will be useful for, for the follow-up pipeline. So <clears throat> our main pipeline is very easy. We just compile um, the, the project's main sources. So in order to do that, we need to take the project as an input and extract the, uh, the right property from, from that project. So that's using ContraMap in order to pre-process the input. Same thing for the binary. Uh, the only difference is that uh, for, for the binary, we need not only the sources from the main uh, project, but also the sources from the test project. But otherwise, they look very similar. Generating the tests is just taking the uh, binary and then running it. Uh, so as you can see, it's pretty much, it pretty much rolls off the tongue. Generating the documentation, Again, uh, extremely simple. We, get, we can just pre-process our doc uh, pipeline by taking the project and extracting the source of our main, um, main project and, and you know, running ScalaDoc on it, whatever. Armed with that, I can, I can finally write the second half of um, the pipeline. In order to build my artifacts, I not only need the main, the, the two binaries and the docs, I'm going to uh, not only contra map on that, but also map. So that's the die map combinator, where the first function will take the input and feed it into um, the pipeline that I just built. And the second argument takes the output of my, uh, of my pipeline. And just uh, as I said, it's just to align the types, reprocesses it into a type that matches the input of the next pipeline, which in this case is the package pipeline. The deployment tasks, 
uh, it just takes the artifact. And uh, in addition to that, it has to provide the repository, which is the input that we were, you know, that we didn't really know where it was coming from previously. It's just a property of our project in this case. So by just taking the output of my artifact along with its own input, I can feed that into the deploy, deploy pipeline and I'm done. And then finally, our whole pipeline is just the sum of um, running the tests, uh, generating the documentation, and then finally generating our artifacts. Once we have that, uh, then we can feed it. Uh, uh, that's the result our, our pipeline is done, essentially. That's the, the result of our, our full pipeline. I don't really mind if it doesn't represent a, a real life pipeline. What I know is uh, using that language, I'm able to represent any form of uh, logic that, um, you know, any form of a control flow that I, that I want to represent. Now, one um, criticism about, you know, that kind of language is it, is it it's a bit more verbose than traditional functions. Um, so that's one of the two sort of criticisms that often comes about when you start talking about uh, arrows and profunctors, which are uh, essentially what we've been talking about for the past uh, 20 minutes. Yes, uh, there are, it, it is true. There are solutions for that. I can, uh, if I if I have time, I I, I will cover them. Um, however, what they give me in exchange is the ability to you know manipulate my programs, observe my programs, optimize my programs if I want, transmit my programs over the network, uh, and so on and so forth, which are the properties that I that I wanted. So for me, it's a win, and I don't mind if um, you know sometimes I have to write these expressions. However, this is, uh, again, not very useful if we cannot compile it into a real-world program. Um, how do we do that? Well, it's just a one-liner. Uh, so we get back a function that represents the actual program that will run our pipeline by just running the evaluator that we've been uh, describing over the next few slides over this pipeline. And boom, we have a, a program that can, um, uh, that can execute the actual function. So, we do, we, do, we do get the full round trip here. Okay, so this is the first half of uh, the work. Um, the first half was about creating an abstraction that allows us to represent functions without actually writing functions. And uh, the reason is that we wanted to have a language that allowed us to express logic or to express control, control flow without having to actually write that control control flow without having to commit to a specific implementation. By doing that, then we get the property that we can have multiple implementations for our program. So um, I, I mentioned the ability to distribute work over a network. That, that is only one uh, you know, possibility. Another one that we want to have, for example, is the ability to visualize the computation graph uh, as a graphic, for example. So we, we could generate an SVG out of, uh, out of that pipeline in order to see uh, visually where the work is happening and what kind of tasks are happening. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that we could do with that. Um, and hopefully I will be able to cover some of them. What I want to cover now is how uh, still limited this is. Um, the reason for that is that we spent a lot of effort to build a data type that okay let's let's face it it can only do one thing it can only execute the pipeline <laughs> um, that's a lot of work for representing a, a fairly simple thing and this is the second kind of criticisms that is made about arrows and profunctors in general uh, they are way more you know um, the 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 set of mathematical constructs that underlie these data types is way more complex than uh, monads and, and applicatives and so on and so forth. Uh, just because you have to write all these combinators that in order to achieve very, very simple things. Um, so what if tomorrow I have another kind of task that takes a lot of time and I want to do exactly the same thing? I'm not going to repeat myself, right? Um, so what is the strategy that we're going to use? Well, the answer is 
is kind of simple. We are going to take out all the things that um, make this specific to um, to the example that I showed earlier. All right. So the, the, the difference here is that I'm going to remove all the tasks that are specific to the pipeline. And uh, what do I have in exchange when I'm going to move that into a type parameter? So here, the difference, as you can see, the five tasks that I defined earlier are gone. And in exchange, I gain a, a type parameter. So I'm, I'm still far off from the seven type parameters of a, uh, in the ZO library, but I get double points for having a type parameter with two holes. Uh, so that, so that, that type parameter is exactly the same shape as my, uh, my pipeline. And this is going to be a characteristic of, uh, of these arrows, uh, these free arrows and free profunctors. They always take a, as, a, as a parameter a type that is made of uh, two holes. One is contravariant and the other is covariant, at least two holes, at least. However, I want to keep all the ones that I introduced after to you know, manage control flow uh, just because these are the ones that are going to be shared by all the all the other cases that I that I want to represent. All right. So the term that I'm going to use um, is uh, sublanguage when I talk about the specific cases that I want to represent. And this is going to be uh, the the free structure that is um, going to graft on these cases uh, additional additional properties. However. I still don't have the ability now to represent uh, an actual term of my sublanguage. Uh, so I'm going to have to add a new term to, um, to this data type here, which is just taking one term of that sublanguage, a value of type P, and you know, lifting it into a pipeline, just like that. And of course, if I have that, I need to be able to convert that into a program. How do I do that? Uh, first off, I'm going to change the name, by the way, uh, just because uh, pipeline is a bit uh, too focused on a specific use case. Arrow is like the uh, the term used in, uh, uh, in in most libraries to represent this data type. I like the name, so let's let's just change the name. Um, so okay, so now I have my my data type. And all these combinations, all, all these terms that I just uh, that I just uh, removed need to go somewhere. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce that somewhere by uh, resurrecting the pipeline. And that pipeline will only be made of the specific terms that are sensible for this pipeline. And in addition, I'm just going to lift all of them into uh, the arrow uh, so that I get arrows for each of these tasks. And as soon as I do that, then I get for free all the combinators that we introduced previously. So the ability to compose, to join, um, to branch, uh, to zip, and so on and so forth. Obviously, I need to put the logic that was taking my pipeline into a specific task, a specific program for executing, executing it into its own evaluator, so to speak. Uh, so th this is just moving code around. Uh, but again, this is just the business logic that is specific to this specific use case. If I were to develop a new language for something else, let's think about, I don't know, um, analytics uh, pipelines, data crunching pipelines, and so on and so forth, I would build a specific data type for that with only the terms that I care about uh, to express data transformation pipelines. And I would write an evaluator just for that for that data type. Uh, but then, armed with that, I can then update the evaluator of my now called arrow data type um, into something that will be able to evaluate uh, the underlying language itself. Well, how do I do that? Uh, I need to be able to evaluate the lift combinator. That's the only thing that is missing, right? However, at this point, I don't know how to do it. I don't have, uh, I don't know what P is. I don't know what P means. It's uh, quantified universally here. Uh, so I need more information. In order to do that, I just introduce a new parameter to my evaluator. So this is the type of my 
uh, parameter. It is a polymorphic function. Uh, so this is kind of the, the new, uh, a new kid in the block in the, in the Scala 3 language, uh, where you have a function that itself takes type parameters and it yields, in our case, a function that will take our uh, value of our uh, sub-language and will return a concrete program executing that uh, specific term. As soon as I have that as a parameter of my evaluator, uh, well, then suddenly I can, I can um, evaluate the, uh, the term lift into, into a program just by running uh, that function f against the input. And, and I'm done. The rest is unchanged. That's exactly the same as before. Now, how do I get back um, uh, the pipeline function that is made of not only uh, the arrow combinators, but also the evaluation of my specific uh, terms uh, of my pipeline language? Well, I need to pass that, that additional function to the evaluator. And that is the eval pipeline that I that I wrote a couple of slides ago. So here I'm not I'm not able to unfortunately pass eval pipeline itself uh, just like that because dot is still not powerful enough to um, infer that the types do match the type of uh, the parameter. I have to help it a little here by providing a bit more uh, type annotations, but otherwise it's quite concise. I like it, and in the end. I do still uh, get a program that can take my project into an actual result. And boom, I'm done. Cool, that's excellent. Um, so with that, we've, we've been able to uh, already uh, express quite a lot of things. However, um, the next frontier, so to speak, for me is uh, the ability to mix and match pipelines of different natures, so to, to build you know, heterogeneous kinds of tasks. Okay, so I want to talk briefly about uh, composition at a different level. And by that, I mean uh, that I want to be able to take two languages that are completely different. Uh, I want to take two um, expressions that represent terms of those languages and combine them in order to form larger heterogeneous graphs of tasks. So I need a way to compose these together uh, in some fashion. And fortunately, profunctors, which are the, the structure that underlies um, the arrow data type that we built, they do compose quite, uh, quite naturally. In fact, they compose pretty much like functions do. Uh, the only thing, again, is that the, the output of one uh, matches the input of, of the other. And how do we? Uh, how are we going to represent that in our language? Uh, well, we'll have to introduce a new data type, and as you can see, it's indexed by four type parameters, so almost there. The first one is going to be our first language, uh, the first language made uh, that our uh, graph task is made of. The second is the second language our task graph is made of, and finally, we need these input and output data types that are going to be. Uh, expressing the overall input and output of my composition. In order to uh, compose two terms of, uh, so one of each language, I need to introduce uh, one single constructor for my, for my new type. And that constructor has a, an additional parameter X that acts as a blue between the two terms of my sublanguages. As you can see, X is the output of from and is the input of two, and it disappears from the type. Now, when I'm armed with that, I can obviously evaluate that composition, but only on the condition that I can evaluate each branch of my composition, right? And because here P and Q are universally quantified, uh, this information, we cannot, we cannot make it out of thin air. We, it has to be provided as parameters. So again, this evaluator needs this time two functions, um, each responsible for evaluating a branch of my uh, composition. And the actual program is, is quite easy. Uh, we first are going to evaluate the first one. And then the output of that first one is going to be fed into 
um, the input of the second one. Again, it's quite easy and elegant. Now with that, um, I can start composing, composing multiple languages into as many, uh, depending on the, the kind of uh, graph that I want to represent, uh, into many different, different uh, computation graphs. So here, just to give you a very, very brief example, very simple example of how I could either um, compose a, a graph that represents a compilation pipeline, a deployment pipeline, with a graph that represents an analytics pipeline. Let's say that my analytics pipeline is analyzing the performance of my overall build. Uh, then I can do that with uh, a composition that takes first my graph of uh, that represents the build pipeline, and then the graph that represents the analytics pipeline. Furthermore, um, I can do the other thing. I can do I can have a single graph where each task itself is made of the combination of a, a, a compilation pipeline, let's say, and an analytics pipeline. So here, the difference is that instead of having two graphs that are interconnected, I have one graph where each step in the graph is a connection of two pipelines, a connection of two, uh, of two languages. So that's kind of very powerful. Uh, once you start playing with that, you can, you can reach, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. Your ability to reason about these things is uh, uh, much more powerful than um, anything you, 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 you can represent with simple functions. Okay, uh, that is pretty much all I had. Um, so where are we at at the moment? We are able to represent um, functions using simple values. These values are uh, essentially describing the control flow of concrete functions. We are able to compile these uh, like trees or graphs back into functions. So with these two properties, we get all the things that I wanted uh, at the beginning. We get observability. We are able to look at the data type and perform optimizations on it. And moreover, we have the flexibility of, uh, flexibility of choosing how we want to uh, transform it into a, a concrete program. And that, um, even though I didn't really cover how to do it, um, gives me the, the ability to introduce system qualities that, are, that I really want. So the ones that, are, that allow me, for example, to deploy work across a, a network, uh, the ones that allow me to resume in case of failure, these are the properties that I'm able to add on top of um, this uh, way of describing programs just by choosing a specific uh, implementation for my compiler. Um, and the beauty of the solution is that I, I can, I'm able to represent my business logic using that language and it will never be you know, um, flooded or it will never drown into um, implementation details like uh, snapshotting the inputs or like sending the sending the data over the, the wire to uh, a cluster of machines, uh, things like that. These things I want to push to the to the edge of my program and hide them away from the actual business logic. What we lose in the process is um, unfortunately the, uh, the the kind of expressions that we build become above a certain level of complexity, they become quite hard to read. Um, so that is a, an often a very big, big criticism of arrows. There are solutions though. Um, the first one is in the form of a compiler plugin. Uh, so um, in the Haskell world, there is one compiler plugin that allows you to sort of write this as a full comprehension or very close to a full comprehension. There is something similar in the Scala world uh, that has been built by the um, the great Oleg. Uh, it's the Volca plugin, I think it's, it's called. I think we can reuse it, but in my opinion, this is not enough. Uh, in fact, I would argue that source code is uh, very limiting because source code is kind of one dimensional. What we want is something that can, uh, you know, allows us to visualize parallel computations and, uh, and uh, two dim dim dimensional diagrams is way more expressive in that sense. So my aim as a next step is to build a, uh, a UI where business people can essentially draw 
business diagrams. And these diagrams are automatically compiled into these uh, arrow expressions uh, without the need of you know, defining implementations or anything. Uh, because as soon as you define your basic terms, your basic components, then um, your job is done. You can essentially give the keys to you know, the domain experts and so on and so forth. They can build whatever sort of logic they need for their, for their particular set, set of problems. And under the hood, you can write a compiler that will not only optimize your program, that will dispatch your programs across a network of nodes and, and yada yada. Uh, so all these things. So it would be fair to say that I didn't even invent anything, uh, far from it. The, it's kind of part of the functional folklore that arrows represents business, uh, business processes. Uh, there's a lot of papers on, uh, on that. Um, here is a few pointers that I, has been very inspiring to me. In particular, I want to cite the, the FunFlow library, which while I was researching a solution for, for a particular problem, uh, and I had some kind of uh, idea of what I wanted, I came across this um, blog post by the Twig uh, company, and they essentially, they essentially had the exact same idea, only way, expressed in a way better uh, fashion. So I, I did, uh, I did uh, inspire, uh, the solution that I built is heavily inspired by the FunFlow library. I recommend you take a look to it. And all right, that's, that's it for me. Uh,